Okay, so the goal today is to dive into primates and figure out just what a primate is and how that differs from this word hominid. And you've heard me say hominid lots of times. You are a hominid, okay? You are also an animal and you are also a primate. If you think about it, that shouldn't be shocking because, well, you're not a plant or a fungus, are you? Hopefully not, or a bacteria or an archaea. So yeah, you, you are, you're an animal, right? You're not, not anything else, not any other weird stuff. Um, but a lot of things are animals, including snails. And we're pretty different from a snail. Um, so let's kind of dive in here and see what some of the differences are, okay? Um, you know, you might think, well, why do we care? Well, we care because humans are interested in like how we are the way we are. Like, like why are we like this? Like, why do we look the way we look? Things like that. So this is a tree of, of life. This is a heck of a phylogenetic tree. And it's going from the earliest formation of the planet and the first things that we see in the fossil record, which are bacteria, not too exciting. Prokaryotes, no nucleus, tiny little things, fossilized. And going upwards from there, we have another group that's really similar to the bacteria called the Archaeans. Archaeans are basically bacteria, but with slightly different proteins that they make. And from what we've understood is Archaeans are actually more closely related to eukaryotes, which we are, than uh, bacteria are. So bacteria are actually more ancient. A lot of the Archaeans live in very harsh environments like salty, salty areas. They, they're like, they love uh, salt or they live in very, very hot areas like they're thermophilic, they love hot regions. They can live in places other things can't. So they're really interesting creatures, um, not too interesting to look at. They're little bacteria looking things. Um, along comes eukaryotic life and most of the life that you know of is all of this eukaryotic stuff. I mean, look at how much, this is all eukaryotic life all the way to the end there, from the brownish colored stuff all the way out here to the end of the mammals. That's a lot of stuff. But even so, if we were to take all the bacteria or all the, all the archaea, they would outnumber everything else up there on the whole tree. That's how many there are. They're the most successful creatures of all time. They have survived from the earliest moments of Earth's history till today. If there's a nuclear war, they'll still be around next time right, while well, everything else is gone. So these things are pretty tough, and they're pretty good at what they do. But eukaryotic life is interesting because it contains complex organelles like Golgi bodies, a nucleus, right, all these membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts, and we talked about how there's some endosymbiosis there. But looking up through the eukaryotic life here, there's a bunch of kingdoms you're gonna recognize and a whole bunch of classes and orders and things like that. Like we have the plants up here, We've got fungi. Um, going over here, we've got the fish and the amphibians. Remember, we talked about the story of how the first lung evolves in fish, as well as all the phalanges, the fingers, and the wrist joints, and all that stuff. That's, that happens in these coelacanth-like fish. The lung first comes about in fish, and we can see it still today in the lungfish, which is still alive today. So amphibians are descended from fish. Amphibians are like frogs and toads and salamanders and such. Reptiles are then descended kind of from the amphibians, and reptiles come up with this unique method of surviving inland away from water. They can lay an egg. It's an amniotic egg that has all the water stored in it. They develop scales so they could be further inland and exploit resources that amphibians couldn't get to. So the egg's pretty, pretty big deal, right? And some early mammals also use the egg and still do, like the platypus and the echidna. So out of the reptiles come a whole bunch of different groups. Out of the reptiles arise the dinosaurs, the ruling reptiles. Out of the reptiles arise the mammals. We're, we also came from a, rep, a reptilian ancestor. Um, and mammals and, and, and uh, dinosaurs are alive at the same time. Somewhere in that mix, birds are branch off from the dinosaurs. And they still, we do still consider birds dinosaurs, right? Um, if you want to see a dinosaur, uh, look at a cassowary. Like those big, huge birds, the flightless birds, uh, those things are scary. Like people die all the time owning them because they've got the big three toes like that. And that one middle toe has that big, huge, like sharp, sharp nail on it. And they will stick that foot out and just disembowel something. You can imagine T-Rex jumping onto something and just shredding it with its legs. It wouldn't even need his jaws, right? So uh, 
it's pretty cool to look at that stuff today. And those birds actually have that cool little crest, kind of like some of the, um, I don't know, like some of the duck-billed dinosaurs had and stuff like that. They have a cool little crest sort of thing. But they're still alive today. And then mammals in all of our forms are on this list right here. There's a lot of different types of mammals. When we look up here, we'll find like all of the, all of the old world monkeys, new world monkeys, tarsiers, chimpanzees, gorillas, that we're all up in here as well. Neanderthals on there too, way at the end there. Um, but a lot, a lot of stuff on this tree, right? And understanding it's pretty complex, but we've talked about a lot of it already. Today, we're just gonna focus on the primates in particular, because you are a primate. So what makes you a primate? What's your monkey-like nature? Primates, have we can define them with a couple of characteristics, and like we said in biology all along, it's, there's always exceptions to the rule. It's difficult to pin down any one group, whether it's a kingdom or a phylum or a class. It, it's, it's malleable because of evolution. There's always some kind of outliers that you're not really sure what to do with. But by and large, primates have these characteristics, and the first one is they have long fingers with nails, not claws. Think about how unique that is. Look at your fingernails. Like, why do you have fingernails? What is that good for? It's strange, right? It's very different than, say, a dog or a cat or a lion or any other type of mammal you might think of. We have fingernails, just like a chimpanzee does. Why do you need fingernails? Well, if you've ever broken a fingernail off entirely or if you know somebody who has where it's gone, watch them try to pick something up without a fingernail. It's actually really hard. That little th thing provides backing and support to your fingers, so when you grab something, you can actually get a hold of it. Without a fingernail, you're at a loss. Or something really tiny that you need to just pick up with just your fingernails, super duper useful. Or how about, like, say, opening an orange? How would you do that without fingernails, if you're not using a knife? Think about a dog opening an orange. Right? I mean, what's it going to do? It's probably going to maul it to death with its mouth, right? Or it's going to get its back foot on there and claw at it like a cat might or something to try and rip it open. It's going to be a mess. Or how about a dog trying to eat a banana? Right? It doesn't have fingers and have fingernails. It's very, very hard to do. So having this adaptation uh, early on has allowed humans now to do things like use tools. Imagine trying to type on your keyboard if you had claws. We just, we wouldn't be where we are, would we? A lot of weird, really weird quirk events have allowed humans to do what they can do, which is kind of neat. So fingernails is the first one. Let's take a look at some hands here. And you can see Homo sapiens is us. There's a gorilla, a chimpanzee, a gibbon, and a tarsier. So there's a couple of things up here. Um, there's an eye eye and a, uh, uh, a tarsier up here, I believe. So the eye eye is kind of, boy, he's got some weird eyes, doesn't he? <laughs> I love the eye eye. It's kind of crazy looking. Um, so this guy here, he has a middle finger that is like really long. It's, it, it's, it's this long extended thing. And what they'll do with those is they'll actually stick it down like a, a, a whole insect hole in a tree and, and tap on it, and thump on it, and then pull it out and grab the grub or whatever and eat it. It's not so great for him because a lot of the native peoples where this thing lives uh, think it's the devil because it's kind of creepy looking. It looks kind of like a, a little bit sort of like too much like a primate, sort of human-like, but also really kind of scary looking. So they kill it, um, which is kind of sad, makes it endangered. But really weird looking creatures out there. They're all primates. Okay. So um, another characteristic that we have as primates is we have arms that can rotate around a shoulder and a very strong clavicle. That's your shoulder bone up here. Does anybody know why we would have arms? Like, what, what's the reason to have an arm for a primate that can rotate like this? What's that? To swing, right? Because where do most primates live? In trees, right? The earliest primate ancestors that we have evidence of in the fossil record are all tree dwellers. And being able to reach up to climb is huge. Think about a dog trying to climb a tree. I know cats can pull it off, but they use their claws to dig in, right? But, but monkeys, ch uh, chimpanzees, primates, they can climb trees like no tomorrow. In fact, they can swing from one branch to the other. Like they can reach upwards. Think about the uses of that now that we have. It's been passed down to us, but you can swing a hammer. You can get dishes off the top shelf. 
You can move your arm around behind yourself and scratch your back. N not other organisms can't do that. It's a really unique characteristic that we have. And we can look at that throughout all sorts of different ancestors that we have here. So the next one I want to mention is binocular vision. Okay, that last one there, number four. So we have what's known as stereoscopic or binocular vision. And it allows you to perceive things like depth. And it is a seriously useful skill to have. Think about living in a tree where you're going to jump from one branch to another and you can't judge the distance to that branch. ruh -ro, like that's a, that's a big fall. A lot of these things are way high up in the canopy. You ever guys ever see an animal fall out of a tree? It's kind of scary. I've seen squirrels fall out of the tree before. Usually they're kind of lucky and they bounce off the leaves, but it doesn't look like it feels real good. Um, I've never seen a squirrel die falling out of a tree, but I could pretty well guarantee that if a human fell from, you know, 40, 50, 50 60 feet up in the top of a tree, we wouldn't be making it. Or even a chimpanzee, that's a long ways to fall. So being able to judge when you're going to jump between one branch to the other, really useful, right? But we use this now today, like you go across the street and you want to know how far the car is away. If you only had one eye, you'd have some trouble with that. Now you could still perceive shadows in relative heights, like the further away something is, the smaller it is. So you can kind of pick up on it a little bit. But, but really, having two eyes, that's, that's huge. And having them placed where they are is huge. If you want to see how this works, hold your finger out. And then sight in on something with one eye. Okay, and then open and close the other eye, like switch eyes, and you'll see your finger jump back and forth. If you put it over my head or a pencil or something like that, you'll see it pop back and forth. That's your stereoscopic vision. You see it from one eye like this, the other eye like that, and your brain figures out the parallax angle, and you know like how far away it is. It's pretty slick, right? So how did this develop and, and kind of why? Turns out that being a predator has a lot to do with it. Predators tend to have their eyes facing forwards like we do because you need to zero in on your prey and go and kill it and eat it. And yeah, even chimpanzees will kill stuff and eat it, right? So uh, if you look at in comparison to say like a, a deer or a cow or something like that, their field of view is very different than ours. We can't see back behind our heads because our eyes are up front. In fact, if I put my arms out and start wiggling my fingers and bringing them forward, I can see about right here is about the limit right here that I can still see my fingers. I can't judge depth very good. I don't know, can't really judge how far away they are, but I can see movement, right? As they get closer and closer, if I can see it with both eyes, there's the limit of where my stereoscopic vision is. And I can actually see like how far away something is very well. So if you want to work on something, it's usually kind of right here, right? Out here, is, it's just a little too hard to pick up on where it's at. Now, that's really good if you're the one zeroing in to go hunt something. But if something's hunting you, it's much better to be able to see almost all the way around back behind your head. If you've ever tried to sneak up on, say, a cow or something like that, they always know you're coming because they can see almost, half, almost all the way around their head. Those eyes separated on both sides of their head like that. So um, it's been a very useful thing for our species to be able to have that. It's kind of the difference between saying, seeing this maybe, versus you know, seeing this, right? Color is also a really useful thing for us. Having those extra receptors to perceive color is super useful, helps us pick up on a lot of stuff. So where are we at here? I've added one more. Primates mostly have well-developed cerebrums. So we have this big, thick head with a big brain in there. Okay. Not all organisms have this. But most primates have a very well-developed de cerebrum. And that has allowed us to do some stuff, some really important stuff. If you think about it, this, this is kind of the crowning moment for our species. Okay. But not just our species. All primates, all primates, for the most part, have this larger cerebrum. And it's allowed us to do a lot of stuff like learning, wage war, solve problems, reflect on ourselves. And this really interesting one here, consciousness. Think about this for a second. I don't want to get too far into it. But think about how do you know like, that you are you apart from anything else? 
Like, you, I know you know that you're you, and you know you're not somebody else. You have a very strong sense of self. Like, you are you. Do you think a dog has that? I know you might want to think a dog has that, but a dog doesn't know that it's it apart from everything else. If somebody comes and, you know, steals your bacon, you know they took your bacon, and you're mad at it, and you remember it, right? But for a dog, like, it, yeah, it knows that its food's been taken away, but it, it doesn't really know it's separate from its environment in such a way. It doesn't have a consciousness. It doesn't have a sense of self. And this has created a really unique situation for humans. It's allowed us to do stuff that no other creature has been able to do. It's also been a bit of a burden because, of course, humans have this, have this problem where they know and they understand that they will die someday. Think about that for a second. Does a dog sit around and think, someday I won't be here? Like, that's huge. Humans, as far as we know, are the only species that sits around and thinks, what happens when someday I won't be here? That's, a big, that's kind of a real big deal, right? And it's a big problem for our species. It's something that, that we, we struggle with, right? Uh, but it's also been the basis for probably our largest, I don't know, achievements of all time. Because a consciousness allows us to see ourselves through other people. So, for instance, I can look at you guys right now, and I have, like, just instantly, I don't even have to think about it. I instantly know who's bored, who's thinking about something else, who's, like, wrapped in attention, who is, like, off in space someplace, right? Who's, who's fallen asleep? Like, I can, I can pick that up instantaneously, and you can do it, too. You can look at somebody and know that person's hungry, or that person would really like what I have. And then conversely turn that on its head and go, here's a banana. Like, why don't you eat something? Like, I'm going to take care about you. I care of you. I care for you, right? Or even rescue another one of our own species just for the sake of rescuing it. Like, you're not going to see that amongst other animals. So this consciousness, this idea of I am me and, I, and I'm, I'm different, but I also care about these other things, has allowed us to work together in a way that any other species hasn't been able to pull off, at least living species. There are some extinct ones that we very much so uh, understand they did work together, and they probably had consciousness just like we do. Right? So it's kind of an interesting thought anyway. So how does that play out? Well, if we just look at brain sizes, um, and these are some of our ancient ancestors. Uh, here we are on the right, Homo sapiens. Look at the size of our noggins. Yep, most Neanderthals actually had larger brains than us. Right? So clearly the size of your brain isn't everything, but maybe they were more intelligent than us. It's interesting. Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Australopithecus, all had large heads, large brains um, for their size. Like remember, Australopithecus was like little, pretty small. But for its size, it had a pretty big head. It had a lot of brains in there. So it's kind of interesting. But you really see somewhere around kind of Homo erectus time, brain size becoming kind of modern proportions, like, like large portions. So do we think Homo erectus probably spoke, probably had language, probably like thought about itself and about others? Yeah, I, we do. Like look at the size of its brain and we look at other behaviors that it had and things that it left in, its, in the fossil record. Um, Neanderthals, we have no doubt. We, we really have little doubt about Neanderthals. And partly because some of us have some of them in us. Talk about that one in a second. So, uh, somewhere about 15 million years ago, primates, as we know, lived in sort of these lush tropical areas. There were no hominids yet. So, we're hominids, like chimpanzees, all the monkeys that you know about, all the rest of the apes, they're primates. They're not hominids like us. So, when I say things like the chimpanzee is our closest living relative, it is, it's our closest relative that's still alive but it's definitely not our closest relative. All of our closest relatives are extinct, and that makes sense, right? So th th we're not that closely related to them, but, but there is a branch, okay? But this is about 15 million years ago, we've got the first primates living in trees, and then something happens. Does anybody know where, where the first primates are kind of all living? What's the scene right here? Do you see where this is at? What country? It's Africa. And in, indeed, we, we are quite certain that Africa is the seat of the evolution of hominids. Hominids come out of Africa. There is zero doubt in our minds. 
Um, originally, Europeans didn't like that idea. They wanted hominids to have first evolved in Europe because, of course, they think they're special, right? But the evidence points for an origin in Africa for sure. And here's a little bit about what we know. About 35 million years ago, because of plate tectonics and uplift and the movement of plates, this lush tropical forest started to dry up and it became more of a savanna with clumps of trees interspersed with lots of grasses. Think about how that's going to change things. Grazing mammals start to become widespread and along with them, carnivorous animals that want to eat the grazers start to be really widespread across this African savanna type habitat here. So looking at that, um, what's going on really, like I just said, is there's some tectonic uplift. Um, it's becoming more arid. We're giving way to these like savanna type regions. Um, and primates, we think, started leaving the trees. They would have had to because there's limited resources in your little patch of trees. Now, what are the problems with when you, when you get down on the ground and you've got these tall grasses? Well, there's predators out there and you're gonna need to see over those grasses. So standing up on two legs and looking out over the grassland is one theory for how primates began to be bipedal, to walk on two legs. You've gotta look and see, is there something lurking in the grass? And then if something starts chasing you, you need to move fast, right? Well, if moving fast means dropping down onto four legs again and being a quadruped and galloping along, right? you can no longer see where it's coming from. So it's, it, it serves you well to be able to stand up and move fast. And so we think this might have pushed evolution towards having this bipedal sort of nature because you're trying to go between clumps of trees. This is just one theory, right? We, we, we don't have really any way of actually knowing um, what went on back then. We know what happened to the climate, but trying to sort the rest of it out is kind of tough. So let's define a hominid. And this is the other definition you might want to get down. So a hominid is, is essentially, we could simply say it, it's every species more closely related to us than chimpanzees. That's a whole lot of stuff. Okay. In general, all hominids are at least mostly bipedal. They walk on two legs rather than four. They have nice opposable thumbs and all the other characteristics you saw when we talked about primates. They have all those primate characteristics, big brains, everything else. But this opposable thumb, this longer opposable thumb, has been pretty useful to us. There were also a lot of changes that happened in the skull and the hip and the spinal column to allow us to be up on two legs. And all of our ancestors too, to be up on two legs. And we'll take a look at some of these groups here as we go. But those are, those are kind of key events right there. So yeah, don't, don't think that every, I know I keep saying, you know, chimpanzees are our closest living relative. That doesn't make them our closest relative. It just means if you go back in the tree, further back than this tree right here even, uh, there's a branch somewhere that leads up to bonobos and chimpanzees. A lot of the other apes. But not, not directly related to us in any way. Everybody got it? Good. Okay, so if we had to define us, we're a hominid, and here's the breakdown. Our domain is the eukaryotes. We, we, we have a complex cell, we've got nuclei, right? We're multicellular. Our kingdom is animalia. We are squarely animals. Our phylum falls into what we call chordata. We have a notochord, which becomes our backbone. So a lot of stuff is a chordate, right? A fish, a a, um, a, a frog, right? All these, any mammal that you can think of, we're, we're all chordates. Lizards, chordates, right? Our class separates us out from all of those as mammals. Like, produce milk, have hair, right? Mammary glands, all those things make us mammals. But there's a lot of stuff that's a mammal that's not a primate, like duck-billed platypus. Mammal that lays eggs. Our order is primate, 
So that includes a whole bunch of stuff that looks everything from monkeys to apes, right? Then our family is homonidae, which you keep hearing me say we're, we're hominids. That refers to our family. So we're getting squarely into this group that is very closely related to us. Then our genus is homo and our species is sapien. So there's only one sapiens. But there are actually a lot of the genus homo, a lot of different ones. And if you look down here, branching off about somewhere around about 6 million years ago uh, is an ancestor that split off to chimpanzee group and then towards us. And there's some big names up here that you'll see down in lab. Artipithecus, okay, another branch. Another branch out here towards these things called Paranthropus. They're real weird looking. They don't really look anything like us, and we don't think they're really related to us at all, but they're more closely related to some of this other stuff. Australopithecines are a big group, and they branch off over here. Some of those Australopithecines may have been a distant ancestor. They could have been on the path to us. Okay. Then we branch off with Homo habilis. Homo erectus branches off over here, and some, some trees actually show Homo erectus as a direct ancestor towards modern humans. So it's, it's difficult to draw these lines sometimes. This one shows it as a branch. And then we have Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. And as we understand it right now, there should really be a dashed line between these two because we have solid evidence that we mated with Homo, with, with, uh, homo neanderthalensis. And that happened up in Europe. So what that means is if you have any European blood in you at all, you very likely have some Neanderthal DNA in you. We've even identified the genes that come from Neanderthals. Isn't that wild? Extinct. If you saw a Neanderthal today, you would be like, uh, gross, that thing is weird looking. I guarantee you, it would freak you out because it would look very human, but it would have some scary characteristics like a huge eyebrow ridge, this big thing sticking out top of its eyebrows. It looked very scary. But we, were very, we lived at the same time as Homo neanderthalensis. And what we found out is that many of these creatures lived at the same time. It's just that right now, we're the only ones. Why are we the only ones left? I've got my own ideas on that. <laughs> I don't think anybody knows for sure. But I'd be surprised if something like Homo sapiens, knowing our nature, could coexist with something else that kind of looked like them. I think we, we would go to war pretty quick. We would want to get rid of that thing that was kind of scary looking. And we still had some interbreeding, even with all that. But we really don't know what happened to Neanderthals. There's a lot of different ideas we really don't know. Here's the groups. Um, there are seven big genera of hominids. Notice chimpanzee is not part of this. Uh, we've got the Australopithecines, the Ar Artipithecus group, the Paranthropus groups, the Homo group, which we're part of. And we're right up there on the tree. But there's a whole bunch of them. You don't have to remember all these. It's OK. You don't have to write those down. There's a whole bunch of groups. So don't write these down. I'm just going to flip through these really quick because I want to get done. Um, I just want you to see some pictures of some different ones. But I want to introduce Chalanthropus. This is a very ancient ancestor, um, 6 million years ago. So this thing probably is somewhat related to chimpanzees as well. Like This is where the branch kind of splits. It was a biped, at least partially. So probably spent a lot of time in the trees still, but could easily walk on two legs. The reason we know that, and you'll do this down in lab, is because if we look at the skulls, there's this thing called the foramen magnum, which is this hole in the base of the skull. And where it's situated tells us where the spine goes in. So if you look at, for instance, modern humans, ours is dead centered against that big massive thing that we call our brain. Okay? Uh, if you look at a chimpanzee, look at how far back it is towards the back of the skull. That's because a chimpanzee is very comfortable on all fours. Its head faces out and forwards on all fours. If we're on all fours, we've got to crank our neck upwards to see. And conversely, if a chimpanzee stands up on two legs, it has to kind of hunch forward and, and bend its neck forward. If you've seen a chimpanzee stand up, it kind of looks a little awkward because it's got to stretch itself to get in the right position with its neck. Its neck doesn't align right. So it's not super comfortable. Well, they certainly can walk on two legs. Um, Chalanthropus, though, probably spent a bunch of time on two legs. Look at that. It's almost perfectly underneath of its head. So uh, probably we're seeing some of the first upright walking here. If you look at a dog, it's kind of the same thing. Look at how far back that hole is. It's number 12 there. A dog, a dog doesn't lift its head up well to walk on two. Dogs don't walk on two legs. <laughs> we know that. So let's flip through some ancestors just for the heck of it. 
We've got Artipithecus. You'll see this guy down in the lab. I'm going to go fast here, so don't, don't stress. We've got Shalanthropus, which is a re real weird little look at the pieces of that skull. You will see that exact skull downstairs. Uh, more Shalanthropus. A um, couple that we're not going to see. You can kind of see where they're branching off here. Artipithecus, we'll see down there. We'll take a cl close look at Artipithecus. Australopithecines, including Lucy, Lucy, huge group, huge group of early hominids. We, these are the ones we have evidence of, of the mother of, of, of a, an adult and a child walking, probably hand in hand, like beside each other. Right? Think about what some of these things might look like. You see that we, we, we draw them, we recreate them, we give them hair because all the apes have hair um, except for us. We're, we're hairless, we're the hairless ape. So we assume that going back in time they probably all had hair. We don't know. We assume they all have dark skin. Again, we don't know, but where, why, do, why does white skin develop? Where, where, do you, where do you have to be? Yeah, northern. So we assume things that lived in northern climates probably had lighter colored skin just because of our melanin content, right? So we assume a lot of these have dark colored skin just based on where they're living. Their whole face could have been furry. We don't know. We're guessing, right? If you saw Australopithecus cross a football field, you'd probably be like, somebody is letting an ape escape from the zoo. Why is it running around on two legs? <laughs> It'll probably look kind of scary, right? Um, some of these other ones would look a lot more familiar, would look very, very darn near human. If we look at this big picture here, I like this because it's kind of interesting, all these different artist recreations. Um, Neanderthals, and this is a very gentle picture of one, um, would have had a much bigger brow ridge probably. This is not very accentuated. Um, but would have looked very much like us. W would have been much more closely looking like us. Uh, in fact, Florensis, Homo heidelbergensis, um, even Ergaster, um, th those, all those groups, there's possibly some interbreeding going on because there's a lot of relationships between some of these things. They're, they're living at the same time. Like, so it's hard to sort out the details a little bit. Um, Habilis would have probably looked quite a bit more familiar to us. Erectus, maybe not quite so much. I'm going to flip through some of these. And then, of course, there's us, right? Which makes us special as our tools, our culture, our language, our, our capabilities, right? Uh, we'll talk about Habilis downstairs. We'll talk more about Habilis. Uh, some Ergaster stuff here. Erectus. Kind of see the branching here. I don't want to talk about this too much. I want to get through this. Um, Neanderthals, of course, we do have evidence of interbreeding. Um, and if you saw a Neanderthal, you, you, you may not find it attractive, but you would be surprised at how much it might look like you. And of course, we've drawn it with light colored skin because where did Neanderthals develop? They migrated out of Africa and ended up in Europe, in that whole region. And so they, they're probably very adapted to that. Um, that life. Homo sapiens again arise in Africa um, and we have some clues about their history. They migrate out of Africa at least twice. There's this huge group of, group of organisms. I mean look at all this. You may, look at the nightmare of trying to put all this together. Right? Look at all these relationships. And uh, I really don't have any, anything up there, um, everything up there. So today there's only one group. There's only us. We're the only hominids on the planet. Why is that? Um, I think probably warfare, probably probably fighting. I, that's what I think. But I, I, we don't really don't know. Maybe the others just didn't didn't hack it, um, which is surprising because like Neanderthals had bigger brains than us. Um, the out of Africa hypothesis is very well accepted. Um, almost all these groups come out of Africa. Um, Neanderthals come out. Uh, then later Homo sapiens come out, and we. The first wave of us doesn't make it very far. I don't know if the Neanderthals killed us off or we just couldn't hack it. It was colder. They were more robust than us. They were suited to colder climates. Um, the second wave seems to survive and interbreeds with Neanderthals. So there we have it. I'm not going to go through all this. It's just like a whole bunch of drawings of uh, coming out of Africa and what that looks like. <laughs> we could talk about this for ages. All the different migrations out of Africa. I just want to get back to here. We go. So <clears throat> we know we know a lot about ourselves now, right? And like I said, if you have European descent, you have some percentage of Neanderthal DNA. 
And if you happen to be of Asian descent, we have recently sequenced Denisovian DNA, which, which, is, which is really interesting because uh, then you've got about 2 to 4% Denisovian DNA in you. So there was a lot of interbreeding going on. <laughs> so we know that much for sure. There we go. You recognize her? Jane Goodall. It's surprising how much chimpanzees look, you know, like, like you definitely know that thing's thinking. It's a little creature, right? Look at it. It's pretty cool.